So an elderly man lay dying in his bed. He's experiencing the agonies that accompany that, that final moment in our lives. When he smells the aroma of his favorite chocolate chip cookies wafting up through the staircase, with great effort, he pulls himself out of bed. Somehow he manages to stagger across the room and with even greater effort, with both hands on the rail, he somehow manages to get down the stairs and he finds himself out of breath leaning in the door jam of the kitchen. And he wonders if he hasn't already gone to heaven for there before him is an entire table of his favorite chocolate chip cookies fresh out of the oven, cooling just the way that he likes them. Or he wonders if this isn't one last heroic effort of his devoted wife to ensure he leaves this world a happy man. And so he, he lunges towards the cookies and, and lands on the floor on his hands and knees his parched lips part in anticipation of this world's final pleasure. He reaches a shaking and withered hand up towards a cookie at the edge of the table. Closer and closer he gets, and just before he takes his prize, thwack, a spatula hits him on the back of the hand. Don't touch those, his wife says. They're for the funeral. <laughs> I just tell that story to simply illustrate that there's a big difference in life between desiring something and actually possessing it. Some of us are kind of like this spiritually. We like to think that we are spiritual people, that we have a relationship with God, or at the very least, we have an understanding with God. I talk to a lot of people out there who, all, who say, you know, God and I, we have an understanding. You know, we like to think that we're going to heaven when we die. We, we like to think that we are experiencing the benefits of the kingdom of God. Yet the truth is that some of us are not nearly as spiritual as we would like to think. Our foundation is not very strong. And when the storms and hardships and troubles of life come, our faith often does not stand up very well. You say, well, that sounds very cynical. We've said that a couple of times here recently about some of the things Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, and here we are at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and I get to say once again, well, I didn't say that, Jesus did. And so here we are in Matthew chapter 7, the very last part of the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll read from verse 24 on. Therefore, Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus is talking about a dynamic that ought to at least give us pause, if not really get our attention. Because he's saying that, in a sense, some of us are under the impression that we're building our spiritual house on rock-solid granite when in reality we're building our spiritual house on the sifting sands of the beach. We think our faith is strong, but our faith is weak. We think our faith is, is healthy, but in reality it's unhealthy. In other words, some of us are spiritually delusional or 
maybe a better way of saying that is some of us are just kidding ourselves. And that's the bad news. The good news is that Jesus tells us here in this passage how to build our house on the rock, how to have a strong faith, how to have a healthy faith, how to have an authentic and genuine and sincere spirituality. And in reality, it's all right here in in verse 24, and the rest of it's commentary on that one passage, but the heart of it is right here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Now, that sounds simple enough, but I found personally, I don't know, it may be different for you, but it's a whole lot easier said than done. But let's see if we can break it down and, and kind of get to the heart of what Jesus is talking about because, you know, I hope that you, you know, like myself, you know, that we have our house built on the rock or I hope that you want that. And the first thing he says is that if we want to build our house on the rock and we want that rock solid spirituality, so to speak, he says that we need to hear his words. We need to know his words, or we need to know his word. Well, what words is Jesus talking about? Well, we're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He's concluding an actual teaching. So which words do you think he's referring to? He's referring to the Sermon on the Mount that we just spent, I don't know how many months going through, six months, seven months, I don't know. It's been a while. And so he's, he's talking about those people who get what he's talking about when he's teaching us how to live in the kingdom of God. Because that's the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount. It's about the kingdom. This is what the kingdom looks like. This is what it looks like when we live in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Be salt and light. He tells us to turn the other cheek. He tells us to do everything we can to be right with others. He tells us... You know, that the the spirit of the matter and the heart of the matter is more important than than what's on the outside. And on and on he goes. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. And he just goes through this whole teaching of what it truly means to walk in the kingdom, what it truly means to follow Jesus, what it truly means to be an authentically spiritual person. And he says, whoever hears these words of mine. And the cool thing about Jesus is that he puts the rest of God's word into perspective because he really blew away those people back then because they thought they had a corner on their understanding of spirituality and God's word and he just came at them from a whole different perspective and just blew away everything they thought. And Jesus never taught anything that was inconsistent with the rest of God's word. In fact, he enlightened it and he he brought it out and brought it into clarity where before there was just so much distortion. And so I believe that if you were to press Jesus on this last verse and say, well, does that refer to the word of God in general? I think that he would have said yes. I think he would have said, you know, these words of mine here in the Sermon on the Mount and the word of God, having that understanding of what God says or or knowing what it is that God says. And that's kind of, tough for us today, or I don't know how tough it is, but it's not the way that it used to be. You know, there was a time in America when people were generally fairly biblically literate. Uh, That's gone. We're not as literate as, as we used to be, and everybody has an opinion on Christianity, and everyone has an opinion on the Bible, but almost no one has actually read it. Jay Leno did this famous bit where, you know, he would do those man-on-the-street interviews, and he would go into to L.A., into the streets, and he would ask people questions on different subjects, and one time he asked people Bible questions, and of course, the whole point was to make fun of people because of how ignorant they were, and people did not disappoint at all. 
You know, for, for example, one person said that Golgotha was the giant who slew the apostle David. <laughs> one person had no idea that Easter had anything to do with Jesus and the resurrection. Another person, when asked who preached the Sermon on the Mount, said Billy Graham. <laughs> and while we may snicker and kind of roll our eyes at how, you know, biblically ignorant people in our society are, Christians really don't fare much better. George Gallup did a study of self-professed born-again Christians on Bible knowledge, and he found that 60% could not name half of the Ten Commandments. That 80% believe the phrase, God helps those who helps themselves, is actually in the Bible, when in reality, it was said by Ben Franklin. And 12%, I just had to throw this one in, even though it's 12%, believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> in conclusion, Gallup wrote, we revere the Bible, but we don't read it, and we don't know it. Maybe that's part of our problem. Maybe that's why... Sometimes we don't feel all that close to God. Maybe that's why sometimes we don't feel fulfilled and joyful. Maybe that's why sometimes we don't have peace. Maybe that's why sometimes we don't have victory. Maybe that's why at times it seems that our houses don't stand up very well to the storms and hardships and problems of life. We claim to be Christians, we've, we've trusted God with our very salvations, we say that we have built our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and except for a few popular, well-known sayings, we really don't know what he says. We revere the Bible, but we don't read it, you know, when we don't know the Bible because we don't read it. Some of us spend a great deal more time, maybe 10 times, 50 times, 100 times more time reading John Grisham and Danielle Steele and Tim LaHaye and Stephen King than we do actually reading the words of Jesus. And so it's kind of hard for us to, to build our lives on the rock when we're really not familiar with the blueprint and when we're not following the blueprint. Some of you guys know that, that I like to cook. And I really like to try and recreate interesting dishes or stuff maybe that I've had in a restaurant. Do I consult the recipe? No, that would be too much trouble. And I must confess that sometimes I do pretty well. And I get pretty close and it works out pretty good. And then other times, I have had absolute disasters. I made sweet and sour chicken that was like chicken mush stew. I made gumbo one time that tasted like dishwater. I once cooked a pot roast, I kid you not, that my dog would not eat. <laughs> now, rest assured, I have rectified all these problems. So if you get invited to my house, know that I will not experiment on you. But I have rectified them. How did I do that? by going to a cookbook or looking it up online, by consulting a recipe. And you know what I've discovered? It's amazing how much better things turn out when you follow the instructions. Some of us live our lives this way. We have a desired outcome. Maybe it's based on the Bible, you know, kind of where we want to be. We want this great relationship with God. We want peace of mind. We want joy. We want meaningful relationships. We want all these incredible things. For, for our lives, and then we just kind of go it on our own, and we do the very best we can. We absolutely do, but we just kind of meddle through, and we have some successes, but we have some disasters as well, and I guess all I'm saying, or what I think Jesus is saying here in building your life on the rock is it's amazing how much better those things go when we follow the instructions. God's word is the instructions. God's word is the blueprint. God's word 
is the recipe for our lives. And if we follow it, it's amazing how much different things can be and how much better they seem to turn out. And so if you want to build your life on the rock, it's important to start with hearing God's word, or that's what Jesus said. I think it's also important for us to understand God's word. And I say that because the Greek word that's used here for the word know, and you see the Bible do this, it uses know in a different sense than just hearing something, you know. Uh, and and that's, it, it includes this idea of understanding. In fact, it's, it's kind of an in-depth understanding is, is what it implies. And I think that's important for us to get because it's one thing to hear, it's another thing to understand. And just because we hear something doesn't mean that something wasn't missed in translation. For example, man asked his wife what she wanted for her birthday. And she said, oh, I would just love to be six again. And so on on the morning of her birthday, he rolls her out of bed at 7 o'clock in the morning and takes her to the local theme park. And man, he puts her on every ride in the park. You know, the screaming loop, the wall of terror, the tunnel of fear, you know, like every ride he could think of. And they wore that park out. About 2 or 3 in the afternoon, they kind of reel out of the park. She's got this headache. Her stomach's turned upside down. He's like, man, we're not resting. Don't get comfortable. Come on. We're going to McDonald's. And he takes her to McDonald's, and he buys her a Big Mac and French fries and a, and a big chocolate shake. Right after that, he takes her to the summer blockbuster premiere of Star Wars and buys her an Icy and popcorn and M&Ms. It was a fabulous day. It was a glorious day. At the end of the day, they stagger home and she collapses in the bed. And he very lovingly leans over and says, well, honey, how'd it feel to be six again? She didn't move. She just opened one eye. And if it's possible to glare with one eye, <laughs> she did it. And she said, you idiot. I meant my dress size. <laughs> we do this with God's word all the time. You know, we grab a verse or two, maybe even out of context, and we run with it, you know, thinking that we're pleasing to God. And I'll tell you, it's amazing, and actually that's the wrong word, it's alarming. Some of the things that Christians do in God's name, trying to justify it with the Bible. Preach the word in season and out of season. And so we think that means that we just go get all up in people's face, violate their personal space, and try to offend them into the kingdom. The husband's the head of the wife. Some husbands take that as that's a license to be a dictator and a tyrant and to have my own personal home slave. The Bible says, be holy, come out from among them, be separate. And so people seem to think that means that, that we need to live in this Christian bubble. We only watch Christian movies, we only read Christian books, we only listen to Christian music, we only shop at Christian grocery stores, we only buy Christian dogs and Christian cereal and Christian this, and anything that is not labeled Christian is suspect, and it's evil, and it's bad, and it's wrong. My theology professor started off my theology course in seminary by saying every Christian is a theologian. The question is, are you a good one or are you a bad one? And his point is well taken, and that is that all Christians interpret Scripture somehow. We, we hang it on some mental framework. It's just that sometimes our framework is loaded down with all this religiosity and even personal bias, which is why it's important for us to get a big picture view of the scripture. 
And the major themes and the major tone of what, of what God is trying to accomplish and what it teaches so that we can hang our interpretation of Scripture on that. And the master of that was Jesus. Again, he came at a time when people were misusing God's word and turned it into this massive legalistic monstrosity. And he came and just cut through the heart of it. He was so good at focusing on what was really important and what God was really about. Which is why it's, I think it's so important for us to come to the words of Jesus fresh and unbiased and just read them and say, Christ, what is it that you're trying to say? Because he just pulled out so many major things, things that we should get, but we still forget them. For example... For Jesus, true spirituality was always internal, not external. It was always relational, not religious. It was always spiritual and about grace rather than, than legalism. Jesus, Jesus always focused on the heart. He always talked about you know, what was real. Again, right here in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, humility. Blessed are those who mourn, the penitent. Blessed are the pure in heart, the sincere. Blessed are the peacemakers, those, those who love and, and bring people together. He, he talked about praying for your enemies and those who persecute you. Again, he talked about trying to be right with everyone. Therefore, if you leave your gift there at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, first leave, then leave your gift, go be reconciled to your brother, then come back and I'll offer your gift. It's about relationships. When you pray, when you fast, when you give, check your heart. Don't be like those idiots that come parading down and making a big deal over everything that they're giving. It's not about that. It's about your heart. Man, he cut through all of that stuff. And he, he taught us that spirituality was something real. It's not a game. It's not a pretense. It's us and God and how we relate to others, and how we work to, uh, with others. Jesus focused on the heart stuff. Love, sincerity, mercy, grace, forgiveness. And he slammed religion and taught and modeled a lifestyle that freed us and empowered us to relate to God in a way unencumbered by rules and human expectations. You say... Well, then, how do I know if I, if I got it? You know, I'm reading a passage. How do I know what the correct interpretation is? You know, how do I know when I, when I understand? And I think there's some very simple questions that can help a lot. You know, is my interpretation consistent with the rest of Scripture? And I think with what Jesus is saying here, is my interpretation consistent with the humble carpenter of Galilee? Is it consistent with the person of Jesus? Is it consistent with the ethic and the tone of Jesus? If I live out this interpretation, will it make me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Does it shed light on the things that were important to Jesus, like grace and mercy and humility and honesty and righteousness and forgiveness? Or does it seem to be more consistent with the things that Jesus stood against, religion, rules, control, pretense, pride, ego, and self-righteousness? Again, we're all theologians. Are we going to take the time and energy to be good ones? Are we going to take the time and energy as responsible Christians to think through our own personal theology, ensuring that it's consistent with not only the rest of God's word, but with the person of Jesus Christ and who he was and what he was about, especially the kingdom of God? He who hears these words of mine, he who knows God's words, the words of Jesus, and understands the words of Jesus. Finally, if we want to build our house on the rock, he has one more section in here, one more important part. 
And that is, we put them into practice. Because later he says, or he indicates, that it's possible to hear and even understand God's word. And there's lots of Christians that do hear and understand God's word. He says, but if you don't put them into practice, then it's like building your house on the sand. It's like building your house on the, uh, on the, on the beach, and when the storms come, your house is just going to wash away into the ocean. And so practice is, is really important. I'm not sure that, again, we're really doing all that well as Christians today. George Barna is America's preeminent Christian pollster. And he did a study not too long ago where he was trying to discern who is coming to Christ in America and why. And here is the review on his findings. So this is how he summarizes his findings at the end of the study. Very interesting stuff. He writes, the largest share of growth, he's talking about those who are becoming Christians in America, the largest share of growth comes from among individuals making 60000 a year or more. Many of those individuals are living the good life. And upon analyzing the salvation proposal, determine that inviting Christ into their life is a smart choice. For many of these individuals, faith in Jesus is simply a good deal. They're not likely to view their faith decision as a catalyst of a lifestyle that demands sacrifice, selflessness, or service. Faith in Christ represents an internal insurance policy for them rather than a significant change of heart about the ultimate meaning of life or how to honor Christ through their decisions, behavior, and resources. This type of Christianity that Barna describes may be popular, but when you start drilling down into it and you really start thinking about it, it's kind of disturbing. It's very me-centered. It's not about following Christ. It's about using Christ. We're not looking to Christ and his word to really direct us in our lives. We're looking for an eternal fire insurance policy. That's Barna's words. You know, we're not being disciples. We're being consumers. We're not building our lives on, on the rock. You know, we're building our lives on sand. For where's the brokenness and humility before God? Where's the honesty that totally opens our hearts to him? Where's the passion that seeks him with abandon? Where's the faith that trusts even when we don't understand? Where's the love and service that makes this world a better place? Where's the self-sacrifice that Jesus modeled? Because I'll tell you this, and, and maybe it's different for you, but, but this is the way it is for me. It's one thing to know God's word. It's one thing to understand God's word. But sometimes it's really hard to put it into practice. Sometimes it's really hard to do it. And I think sometimes that's why as human beings we opt often for religion and religious systems. I think that's why sometimes we have this tendency to be such poor theologians. Why we have this tendency to interpret God's word by convenience and comfort rather than conviction and truth. Because it's a lot easier to create a few simple rules than it is to genuinely model our lives after Jesus and treat people and love people the way that he did. It's a lot easier to create some religious system where we can jump through a few hoops that are really not too hard, that are kind of doable, and think really well about ourselves than it is for our lives to genuinely be about humility and honesty and grace and peace and truth and love and forgiveness and sacrifice and mercy. It's hard to do this stuff. I don't know if Dave remembers this. I thought he was going to be gone today, still on, on his cruise, suffering for Jesus. Um, but he, I don't even know if he remembers this. told me a story a few years back about one of his boys. I won't embarrass them, but one of their sons had a friend that was in his class, and, and he was trying to reach out to this friend who, who was, had, had kind of a rough family life and, and had some problems. And the friend came to a birthday party one time and slipped him some dirty magazines, kind of, this is your real present, wink, wink, you know. And David found out about it. And I thought he handled it spot on. 
I don't know if I would have handled it the way that, that he did. Uh, in fact, I'm very proud of the way that he handled it, which is why I'm, I'm sharing this story. But he calls the boy's father after the party and asked him to come pick up his son. And then when the father came, he talked to the father, showed him the magazines, and told him what happened. And the father was extremely apologetic. And then in a very nice way, he told the father, he says, you know, he said, I think your son might have a problem. And he needs some help. And I know a place that can help him. Would you give me permission to pick up your son on Sunday mornings and bring him to church with us? And the father said, yes. So then they brought in the son. And he showed the magazines to the son and explained to the, to the boy that, that this, you know, wasn't right and, and that what he did was wrong. And he said, I forgive you. And then he asked the boy, he says, now, do you think that you have a problem or that you might have a problem? And the boy nodded that he did. And he said, would you like some help with that? And the boy, I don't know if he knew what else to do. He just nodded yes. He said, would you like to come to church with our family? And the boy said that he would. And for some time after that, you know, David would go and pick that boy up and bring him to church. And I believe that had a tremendous impact on that young man and on his family. Guys, what David did is hard. And I'll tell you why. Because David loves his children. And he's fiercely protective of his children. All of us are, aren't we? All us parents. And that little boy was influencing his son in a way that, that would have been alarming to all of us and, and certainly was to David. And yet he didn't have some knee-jerk, religiously correct, me-centered, fear-laden, rules kind of response. He had a response that was seasoned with grace. And faith and love and ultimately redemption. It would have been so easy to pull that holiness card and just kick that kid out of, out of his son's life and say, man, you're never to have anything to do with that kid ever again. And what would that have communicated to that boy? Guys, that's how I think most of us would respond I don't know how I would have responded. I hope I wouldn't have responded that way, but I'm certainly capable of that. I would like to think I would have responded the way David did because I think that's how Jesus would have responded and how he would have us respond as well. It's hard. It's hard to do God's word. Hard to put those things into practice. Easy to say, turn the other cheek. Easy to say, love your enemies. Easy to say, be about grace and peace and love. You know, and then you're dealing with your obnoxious brother-in-law or that person at work that tells all those off-color stories, you know, or, you know, just insert person here from your life that, that you don't necessarily get along with all that well. That's when it gets hard, but that's what it's about. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. That's what the kingdom is about. It's about being Christ to a world that desperately needs his love, peace, grace, mercy, forgiveness, etc. Build your life on the rock. We want that, don't we? You know, we don't want just we don't want to have just an understanding with God. We we want that that real relationship with him. Where it it like really matters, you know? It, it, it's something real in our lives where it's us and God and he's guiding us and he's helping us navigate all this junk and all this, this crud that's in the world. And somehow through it all, in us doing our best, failing, but, but still doing our best to try and be humble and honest and gracious and forgiving and, and, and peacemaking and, and all that stuff, we're doing our best and somehow through that his spirit comes in and undergirds us and in that whole process we find that, you know, 
I have a lot more peace than I used to have. I feel a lot more fulfilled than I used to. People are telling me, I don't know why, but they're telling me that I'm having an impact on their lives. There's fruit, there's, there's stuff happening. There's this dynamic in my life, I don't know what to call it. But Jesus calls it kingdom living. And it's all right here in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all right here in the words of Jesus. It's in the Scripture. That when we stop relating to the world through our natural instincts and trust Christ to live the way that he tells us to live, all of a sudden it changes everything. And we can't explain it. It's a spiritual thing. But we begin to experience that abundant life that he talked about in John 10.10. And again, fulfillment and peace and grace and all of that. And it comes when we yield ourselves to him and we walk according to him and his word and his ways. And that is building our lives on the rocks. Hard. You know, it's hard to take the time and energy to get to know God's word. It's harder still to take the time and energy to work out a theology of God's word to really understand what it says and the big picture, the macro stuff, and it's harder still to put it into practice. But those are the things that people do who build their lives on the rock.